everyone, this is Chris Lepetyuk, and we're going to go live. Are in those three minutes. Also, just a reminder, just a reminder I, see I see about 30 of you in here so far. We will be recording this. So if you, you know, if you need to leave early for whatever reason, or if you're having any technical difficulties, we will be recording it and it will be online. So no need to worry about that. But you do only receive credit if you are on live with us this one hour. Okay, we're going to wait one more minute to let people log in if they haven't yet. But we are almost going to get started here. And please do type in the chat box if you're having any troubles with audio, video. We'd like as much as we can to help and make sure you can see and hear everything. Chris, have you tried without your headset to just use your camera or, or your audio uh, and mic on your computer? That would make any difference. But France is here broken. I've tried it without well. the headset. That sounds good now, though, Chris. Okay. Does that sound better, Lau? Does she sound broken anymore? Well, I, she'll have to talk a little more. I'm, you know, I, I can't tell from one word. <laughs> I mean, I mean. Okay, well, that's a good. It's good because it's time to start talking. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Well, I'll let you know. <laughs> super. So it's eleven o'clock. We're happy to see everyone on the webinar this morning, and we're happy to share this information and these speakers' knowledge that have so kindly, you know, shared offered to share the work they do with you. So this webinar is about urban forests and air quality. And to that end, we have two air quality experts on today. I'll go ahead and get started. But first, I just want to go through a few house housekeeping items. So this is approximately what your screen should look like. Um, we are, so you'll see a couple of things. There's going to be an ask a question button at the bottom. So if you need to ask a question, please use that box. And then there's also the chat box to your right. If you're having if you're having trouble seeing or hearing anything, or if you want to ask your question in the chat box, that's also fine. So please do utilize those. And now I'm going to turn it over to Francis Waite, who's going to say a quick thank you to the people that made this webinar happen. Yes, I just want to say a quick thank you and um, 
let you know that this webinar series is supported by a grant from the U.S. Forest Service to the South Carolina Forestry Commission Urban and Community Forestry Program. I'm Francis Waite. I'm the Urban and Community Forestry Program Coordinator. And our program mission is to help municipalities and counties build capacity in their own urban and community forestry programs. We're partnering with Plan Green today to provide today's webinar. And I want to welcome you all to our Planning Commissioner webinar series to give commissioners and advisory board members the tools to help you when you're having discussions regarding trees and urban forests. And we welcome our speakers today, Renee Madden and Amy Curran of DHEC. And we hope to give you some ideas and concepts to consider in your decision-making process. Um, I want to go over the agenda today. So we're going to talk about um, air quality metrics, the role of air quality in community, life and health, and what does South Carolina's DHEC do to ensure air quality? What does South Carolina's DHEC do to educate the public? And what can you do to increase air quality using urban forestry techniques? And um, I wanted to introduce you our team, um, our urban forestry team. And um, our programming uh, goals are to help foster, support, and enhance long-term sustainable urban and community forestry programs. We provide technical, educational, and financial assistance to primarily municipalities and counties. Um, so there's a picture of me um, on the top left. I'm the brunette. And going counterclockwise, we have Kara Specht in the green jacket, and she's our coastal region urban forester. Kara assisted Chris and I today with the webinar by reaching out to the air quality folks at DHEC to assist with planning today's webinar. And going counterclockwise, um, we have Lau Sharp, who is an urban forester on staff that you may recognize from assisting communities with our tree cities. And Dina Whitesides is our Piedmont Region Urban Forester in the green shirt, and she has been busy setting up ISA trainings like the Certified Arborist Workshop and TRAC, which is Tree Risk Assessment Qualification Training. Um, Lois is in the multicolored shirt, and she is our PD Region Urban Forester, and Lois has been help, uh, busy helping our PD Region folks and also scouting out worthy individuals for trees awards for the Trees SC Awards. Um, coming up um, the, due in August. So we're very lucky to have such a talented and devoted group here at the Forestry Commission. And we do have some other um, trainings coming up. And I wanted to look at that slide. So we have that track course coming up um, July 26 to 28th in Greenwood. And we have the link on here. Um, I'll put it in the chat. We have a certified arborist class coming up in September 6th and 7th. There is going to be an exam September 13th if you want to take it in person in Columbia. And then we have um, Trees SC, which is a nonprofit that provides a lot of educational opportunities. There's a South Carolina Arborist Workshop coming up September 21st, so it's a day um, for to receive some CEU trainings and some networking. And um, we also have the Trees SC Annual Conference coming up at the Folly Beach Tides Hotel, November 2nd and 3rd. And I'm going to pop some of that information up in the chat so that you can get to those links. Now Chris is going to tell us a little bit about Plan Green and some of the continuing education opportunities. Sure. So you guys are used to me by now. Um, I work with Plan Green. I help communities across the United States help reach their goals using environmental methods, so using urban forestry, using green infrastructure, and I help Francis put together these webinars. And as always, we're was looking for more topics, so if there's anything you're interested in, please do let us know. We're really excited this round that we have, now we have four credit offerings. So we have the SCPEAC, which is basically if you're a board or commission member, those are the credits that you need. And you can receive one credit for attending this webinar. We also have ISA, so if you're an arborist. We also have AICP, if you're a planner, and foresters. So now we have four different options. If you need credits, please let me know by either sending me an email and I'll pop my email in the chat box, or if you feel comfortable, just type in the chat box and I can access this after the webinar ends. So whichever way, email or pop it in the chat box along with your, along with your ISA number or, and SAF number. Super. All right, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn it over to Renee Madden, who's going to start talking about SCD HEX. 
efforts to improve and measure air quality. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to say hi. I'm going to go off now so you can't see me use my cheat sheet. So thank you for inviting us. Today, Amy and I are going to talk about uh, South Carolina's air quality. Now, in my job as a data analyst, I use data from the air ambient air monitors that monitor the ambient air pollution. Um, so what is ambient air? Well, if you step outside, it's all the air that surrounds you. Um, it's not air that's in buildings and we're not allowed to monitor within fence lines, but outside is ambient air. So the ambient air pollution is the harmful gases and particulates or particles that are in the ambient air. Uh, okay. So where, where does it come from? Well, a little chemistry. Um, there are two sources that most air pollution comes from. Of course, there's the natural source from volcanoes, which we don't have around here, and wildfires, which we have very rarely, but we can't have them. Um, but most of our pollution comes from human activities, and that can be traffic, uh, think planes, trains, automobiles. It can be from industry, uh, facilities, it can be agriculture, construction, um, even smaller things like gas powered mowers, leaf blowers, chainsaws. So pollution is usually ca categorized in two ways, primary pollution and secondary pollution. So the primary pollution are uh, things like carbon monoxide, nitric oxide, um, sulfur dioxide. These are just the simple chemicals that are in the air. Then you have the um, volatile organic compounds or VOCs as we call them. And these are the things that give off odor. So now, VOCs can happen naturally because trees give off VOCs, but most of the VOCs are from human activity and it can be from painting, smoking, cooking, uh, wood burning. That's where the VOCs come from. And then the third category are particulates. So, and then you also have secondary pollutants and the secondary pollutants are simply chemicals that combine and react in the air and they actually create a different chemical. And a good example of this is ozone. So ozone is a secondary chemical. So if you take some sunlight, you add some nitrogen oxides to it, you add some VOCs to it, you cook it up in the air a while, um, it, there's a good chance that it's going to turn to ozone. And that's one of the reasons we have higher ozone in the summer than through the other parts of the year. Then the last group we want to talk about is particulate matter or particulate pollution. So if this is a human hair and down at the base, you see that there are um, uh, one, two, three, four, five little balls. And the one little blue ball is about the size of 10 microns. And that's what we call PM10. Now this is things like dust and pollen and mold. And if you look in the drawing above it, within that blue ball, if you split it four ways, then the one little part of it would be considered 2.5 microns. And these are the smaller things. These are the things that can get down further in your lungs. In fact, um, PM 2.5 can even be so small, you have to have a micron microscope to see it. Um, and, and it even can get in your bloodstream. So we're very concerned about the PM 10 and the PM 2.5. So DHEC is tasked with promoting and protecting the public health. And in fact, our slogan is healthy people living in healthy communities. So we're very concerned about the um, air pollution in the air and the health effects it has. Now, I'm not going to read all this graphic, but you can see from this graphic that um, air pollution can affect many, many parts of the body uh, from, you know, the head, headaches, neurological issues. If you come in contact with lead, you can have heart issues, cardiovascular disease, you can have liver issues. Um, it can actually um, have effects on premature babies and on uh, baby development. It can cause birth defects. 
you can have eyes, ears, nose, and throat irritation. But one of the things at DHEC we probably are most um, involved in is respiratory issues. You hear a lot about respiratory irritation, inflammation, infections, COPD, and cancer. So that's the reason that um, DHEC monitors the air pollution. So a little history lesson, what's been done about air pollution. Well, back in 1970, the Congress created the Clean Air Act or the CAA, and they created the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, to carry it out. And they specified that there were six pollutants or what we call criteria pollutants that had to be controlled and monitored. And these are carbon monoxide, nitric acids, which we measure as nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, ozone, particulate matter, PM10 and PM2.5, and lead. So EPA is the one that sets the standards or the level, and the level is called the National Ambient Air Quality Standards or the NACs. And there are two kinds of NACs. There's a primary that's for human health, and then there's a secondary that is for the environment. And I don't expect that y'all can see everything on the screen, but this is the current NAC standards for all six pollutants. And the AP, EPA sets these standards, um, and the states are responsible to create the monitors, maintain the monitors, and be sure that they implement procedures to maintain the standards. And that's a nice way to say that we have to be sure that the standards are not, um, um, they're not gone over. And if they are, then we have to come up with a plan to bring down the pollution so that we'll be in attainment. So the NACs reviews, the EPA reviews these NACs every five years. And in fact, right now they're in the process of reviewing ozone and PM 2.5. Um, also, if you look at the chart, if you can see the chart, there's primary and secondary. Um, averaging time in form is um, what we use for our calculations, and then the level is what they call the NACs. So that's actually what they are at this time. And I'll go over them in, again in a minute. So this is South Carolina's Ambient Air Monitoring Network. The little green um, circles with the black dots, these are monitoring stations. Now you'll notice that all the monitoring stations except the one in Chesterfield are located in uh, colored areas, and these are Metropolitan Statistical Areas, or MSA. And the reason for this is that the EPA, in their regulations, state that all of the uh, monitoring for the criteria pollutants has to happen within the MSAs. We monitor for heavily po um, populated, the heavily um, areas that have a lot of facilities, and these are you know, obviously where the people are. Okay, so also you see that we share three of the MSAs. We share one with Georgia, which is the Augusta MSA. Um, we share two with North Carolina, one in Charlotte, and one in Myrtle Beach. So if you're driving around and you happen to see that something that looks like your picture on your left, this is a monitoring station. And a monitoring station can have many monitors as this one has. This is Park Lane in Columbia. Or actually a monitoring station can just have one or two monitors. Uh, the picture in the middle is a PM 2.5 monitor and we have some of those. Um, some places we only have ozone, that's the picture on your right. Uh, and of course those uh, on your right, those would be inside the building with the little probe sticking up. Um, so, but all of the uh, major or the larger population MSAs have monitoring stations within them. So I'm going to quickly go over where we're at with our pollution and our, um, uh, on the left-hand side is the map so that you can see actually where the monitors are located. And on your right hand side is the um, is the grass for each one. So this is carbon monoxide. Our level for carbon monoxides are very low. 
We typically run maybe one to 1 1.5 um, each year. So, you know, we only have one monitor and that is in Columbia. The next monitoring network is uh, sulfur dioxide. We have five monitors. We have them in the Greenville MSA, the Charlotte MSA, um, and uh, we have two of them in the Charleston MSA and the Columbia MSA. And as you can see, we're in attainment. Uh, the red line on the graph, I should tell you, is the NAX. And the NAX for SO2 is 75 parts per billion. And so we are under that. The highest MSA, if you can read that down there, is would be Augusta. They have a lot more um, industry than some of our other MSAs. So here's nitrogen dioxide. We have four monitors. Again, we have Greenville, Columbia, and two in Charleston. And um, they have, there's two NACs. So there's one that's 100 parts per billion, which is your one hour reading. And then there's a yearly reading of 53 parts per billion, and we are in attainment for NO2. This is our PM10 monitoring network, and PM10 has four monitors uh, in Greenville, Columbia, Charleston, and Myrtle Beach. And the PM10 NAX is a unusual NACs because it is a yes, no NACs. You either attain it or you don't. And if you go over, even you're allowed to go over one time in three years. So um, that'd make a pretty boring graph because we haven't gone over as far as I ever remember. So, um, you know, it'd just be a graph with zeros. So the graph actually shows you the second highest number and it just shows that we are in attainment for our PM10. Here's ozone, and um, ozone there, it has one NAX, which is an eight hour NAX, and it is, the NAX is 0 0.070 parts per million, or 70 parts per billion. And uh, Spartanburg happens to ha be our highest design value for last year, and it was at 63. And then, um, of course, um, in Charlotte, Geringer was at 64. So we're well within the, uh, under the next, so we're well within the attainment. Now, ozone is being reconsidered uh, by EPA. EPA does not want to reconsider it. It feels like it's okay, but we have a one of the science groups, uh, we call them KSAC, um, you know, they review all of the scientific information, and they would like to add a secondary uh, standard to the ozone, because right now it doesn't have one. So they, you know, it depends on the science and the EPA administrator ultimately will be the one to decide. So we'll see this time next year, we might have a secondary ozone standard. So last but not least is our PM 2.5 monitoring network. We have um, 13 monitors in almost all of our MSAs. There are two standards. There's a 24 hour standard and an annual standard. And um, as you can see, we're entertainment. And this is the annual standard. And this is also EPA is reconsidering this standard this year. They've already let us know that the new standard is going to be between 9 and 10 micrograms per meter cubed. So if you look on the graph and you see those little red dots, um, the new standard is going to fall between there. So um, it looks like if that happens, although Augusta is coming down and we may, they may make it under there. Um, if not, then we will have to do some work to uh, bring an area in attainment. But right now, everything is in attainment for the annual PM 2.5. So I get asked um, a lot of questions. And one of them is, what can I do to tell whether my air is good on a daily basis? So I'm going to uh, let's see. Okay, so there, EPA has a really good website called Air Now, and the TV stations, um, a lot of times, if you listen to the weather at this time of the year, they'll tell you, well, tomorrow's a green day or tomorrow's a yellow day, and if you go to this. So what that's talking about is that there is an air quality index. 
and they take the number in real time. These are real numbers, what's happening right now. Um, if you put in your zip code, then it looks at the monitor closest to you and reports back. Can y'all see that? Yes. Okay. Um, it shows the area so you can actually see what's going on. Um, and these are what the colors mean. Uh, the green and yellow means we have good air. I know yellow usually means caution, but in this index, it means that the air is acceptable. Um, and it's, the colors are tied to the index. So if you had an orange day, which we do get some orange days when the um, when it's hot, you know, usually in July and August, we may run some orange days. And what that tells you is that if you have children with asthma, they may not want to play outside as long, or you may want to um, stay inside in the air conditioning if you can. And then the red, purple, and maroon colors are, we don't usually have those. Those happen when there's wildfires and there's a lot of smoke and particulate matter in the air. Now, another question that I get asked is, besides how is my air, is what about smoke? Um, can y'all see that? It should say South Carolina um, Forestry Commission prescribed fire activity. We don't see that. Oh, okay. Let me uh, go back here real quick. Oh, start sharing. Oh. Well, this is a cool little website, and it's good to know that it's there. But a lot of times we get calls, people reporting smoke. Uh, they see smoke in, as they drive along, or they see big puffs of smoke as they, um, you know, are in their activities. So this is a, a can y'all see that? It should say active burns. Yep, we see it. Oh, yay. Okay. Um, so what this website is put out by the South Carolina Forestry Commission. And every day when there is a prescribed fire burn, they put it onto the website. And if you click on it, if you were driving down I-20 today and you happen to look out and see, sure enough, on Fort Jackson, they are burning 123 acres uh, for hazard reduction. And so that helps people know why they're seeing the smoke in the air. Okay. Um, So I wanted to talk just a minute about prescribed fires because we do get a lot of questions about that. Um, a lot of the smoke when people call in, it is a prescribed fire that's being burned. And a prescribed fire is a fire that is planned with a land management tool and it's a planned event. And it's not just thought, oh, you know, somebody goes out here and they're gonna burn 20 acres today. That's, that's not the way it works. Uh, they have a 17 page report they have to complete. Um, the fire manager has to complete it. Uh, it takes in account everything from wind direction to wind speed to the moisture in the air to where the roads are, where possible smoke would go if uh, it were to take a turn. So um, it's a well thought out plan. And using prescribed fires helps reduce the unwanted fuels and the duff that's in the forest layer. And so the reason that's important is because if we ever get a wildfire down here, then it's just if it has not been burned, all of that um, duff will act as, as extra fuel and you'll have a hotter fire that's harder to contain. Also with prescribed fires, because you know it's gonna happen, then they can put out uh, announcements to the community that there's gonna be a prescribed fire and people can take action. If they you know, have a child that has asthma, they can watch for the smoke and be sure that they're inside if it happens to come their way. Um, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you, you know, all fire it produces smoke and particulates and um, a prescribed fire can go awry. It doesn't very often, but it can. The smoke can go where it's not meant to be. But we support our, um, uh, our farmers and our agricultural people, our forest people 
in the prescribed fires because we know it's really good for the land. And I've been told that all questions will be held to the end. So here's Amy. Hey everyone, my name is Amy Curran and I'm the Outreach Coordinator in the Bureau of Air Quality at DHEC. And um, I'm going to talk to y'all about, I'll go on ahead and I just wanted to say, hey, let y'all see me for a second. Um, So I'm going to talk about some of the programs that we have at DHEC. Um, and, and here's the screen of them. Air Now, which Renee has mentioned, is something that we, we definitely promote and use. <clears throat> There's a flag program that the EPA also has that is tied into the Breathe Better program, which I'm going to talk about, which is one of our programs. Um, uh, you see a sign there that says turn off your engine, clean air zone. We have some of those that says uh, turn off your engine, kids breathe here which is also tied to the Breed Better program. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. Um, you see there a, a postcard that we have, and I'm gonna get some of those to Frances Waite so she can um, pass those out and take them to events. And if y'all want any, please let me know. By the way, the QR code does work on here. I put my phone up to it earlier and it does work. I have a bigger screen of it. Um, we also do the Diesel Emissions Reduction Program, which is a grant program. And then um, we have the radon program within DHEC where we promote to having your home tested. And there's also a poster contest that schools can enter um, if, if, with the radon program. So the Breathe Better program, what's, oh, let me go back. I'm sorry, you're, you're good Renee right here. Um, so here's the programs again with a little bit of an explanation for each one of them. And we do support that sustainability and promote as much as we can and uh, promote education to people how what they can do to reduce air pollution. So the Breathe Better program I've already mentioned is an anti-idling program for schools and businesses. Um, we also are part of the advanced program where we work with air quality coalitions, regional partners around the state to help maintain good air quality. We collaborate efforts with them when we actually do events. Um, the Diesel Emission Reduction Act is the EPA's program and administers four components of the grant through a national clean diesel campaign. The radon program, um, any home can have radon. The only way to know is to be have your home tested. Uh, so we do promote that. And then we have in the past done lawnmower exchange events where people can bring in their gas powered mower and replace it with um, electric mower. And Renee had mentioned some of the pollution does come from gas powered, not just mowers, but all lawn equipment. Um, so those have kind of morphed into a lawn exchange program where you can, <clears throat> excuse me, get a voucher and buy something that is electric. It, it could be a weed eater. It could be the, the lawn mower, gas, um, changing a gas powered uh, chainsaw out to electric. So there's lots of tools that you can use that are electric in your yard and we promote that. I'm sorry, Amy, to jump in here and bother you. Do you yeah. mind just talking a little bit about the air pollution that's emitted from those small engines like lawnmowers? All right, so Renee may have to answer that question a little bit more. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's most, it's so, the air pollution really comes from different sources. So it could be via volatile organic compounds coming from the gasoline that's actually burning in, you know, the, the mower. Um, so those are volatile organic compounds, which also it, um, produces ground level ozone gases as well. And so those kind of mix and, and cause actually the ozone, the ground level ozone, not the ozone itself high. Um, and then, of course, if you use, um, you know, something that's gas powered, you also have the uh, particulate matter that is coming from it as well. So all those mix and then, then boom, you have your air pollution. Renee, did I answer that pretty good? Yes, that's exactly right. And it also, it's not just lawnmowers, it's uh, leaf blowers, chainsaws, any of your small, anything that has a small gasoline engine is emitting uh, pollutants into the air. Um, 
So, and I think, from my understanding, a, a, a gasoline engine does not have a full combustion, and so it emits more. Actually, there's not a it's not a full cycle to combust all of what is in there for the gasoline to burn. So, right. There's causes, also yeah. Sorry, there's also there's no um, nothing on it to catch control the it. yeah to control it like yeah. our cars have um, the tailpipe you know on there but um, all of these small gasoline engines they don't and so they actually pollute a lot that's why it's better to use electric if you can yes exactly thank you Renee thank you um, did that answer the question. That's yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to get to why a lot of lawn isn't great because you have to use that gasoline powered small motor, which is actually polluting from what I understand worse than what your car might pollute. Right. Just because of Renee, what they, she said, there's no control measure on there mm -hmm. to reduce the pollution. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little more about the breathe better program. Um, so this one is for schools. So basically what we're asking parents to do, bus drivers to do, is not idle on the school campus. Because if you think about it, children's lungs are still developing and they actually breathe at a quicker rate um, than we may because they're always active, running around, doing stuff. So they're breathing in all that pollution. And right around the school, you have a very concentrated area of pollution when you're waiting in line to pick up your kids. I mean, people go, I don't have kids, but I know that people line up really early and they sit in their car, they chat on their phone or they're on their, you know, on their either, you know, texting on the phone, whatever they're doing, reading a book in the car with it running. Um, and so the Breathe Better program is trying to encourage people to get out of their car, sit around an area um, that's, you know, maybe has some shade, but not to sit in the car, maybe not go to get there so early. Um, and like I just said, children are more sensitive to air pollution and schools can really make a difference because if you think about it, there's so many schools within the communities. If the schools are doing their part, it's also helping the communities. Um, the first thing to do with the Breathe Better program, if any of y'all have children and you want to get started with it, is to identify a faculty or staff member to help you coordinate that program and then get enrolled and of course, I can help from there. Next slide. Yep. So for businesses, it's the same thing. Um, wait a minute, Renee, go back one maybe. There, thank you. So for business, a lot of businesses, there's a large volume of vehicles like deliveries within one day and they leave their, their truck on or their delivery truck or their car, or whatever they're using van to deliver something. Um, at DHEC, there's no idling in the loading zone. Um, I've noticed that when UPS or FedEx or whatever brings a package here at my house, they always turn the vehicle off, get out of the vehicle, you know, bring it to the door. So businesses can really be a leader in their community as well. Just like a school, you've got businesses within communities. So it's just, you just a, a business would enroll in the program and they receive anti-idling signs. Um, they can be put in the delivery area or in front of the business, wherever the person thinks that's appropriate. And also the flag program is part of that as well, as with the schools, where you can have a desktop flag to put on the desktop when people go in, or you can put a flag outside, a garden flag. Um, we have those at DHEC. And I forgot to mention, so when somebody signs up for those programs, they do get uh, air quality flags which correspond to what the air quality is for the day. Of course, the person has to get the forecast. And um, same thing at the school. They, they get anti-idling signs, and then they also get the flags. Um, businesses can do things such as supporting telecommuting policies, supporting alternate work schedules. Like, I, I know that Renee is an early bird, and so she gets up early. She's going into work where when the traffic volume of traffic is low because she's going in earlier and she leaves earlier during the day. So she's not leaving at 530 or five o'clock when all the traffic's out. So that is something also that a um, business can support. And then encouraging carpooling and van pooling for employees, which reduces the number of vehicles on the road. 
So to participate in either one of the programs is basically to reduce idling, which also, by the way, does produce more air pollution and waste fuel. Um, and, and we're focused on protecting the public health on school campuses and local businesses with all of our programs, not just the B2 program. And also there's a lot of really good resources on both on the B2 website. Read Better is also known as B2. Next one. Yeah. So the, the both programs, you can sign up for the flag program and um, you will receive the desktop flags. Like I was saying, they can go in like a little, um, I can't think of the, the plastic folder things where it stands up, plastic stand. We have, we used to have one at DHIC at the front desk. Um, when we would do the forecast, I need to get back to doing that actually. And then also getting the signs as well and the um, garden flags. So here's what I was mentioning earlier. Renee was talking about the EPA's Air Now program. This is a postcard that we do have available. On the left is the front of it, on the um, right is the back of it. You can actually take your phone right now if you want to, and you can do the QR code and it will pull it up. Um, and that website is really cool because you can, like Renee was showing, you can explore data, you can download a mobile app, you can put it onto your home screen. You can even sign up for EnviroFlash, which will send you the air quality forecast every day. A lot of schools and businesses sign up for that when they join, enroll in the B2 program, so they automatically know what the forecast is for the next day. So anyway, like I said, I'm going to get some of those to Francis, and um, if y'all want any, let me know. So the, the coalitions that I mentioned earlier is a network of regional people. Um, it, it could be, an, it could be a, an MSA. It could be one of the council of governments. Anyway, it's just a group of people that are trying to do whatever they can to reduce air pollution in certain areas. And you can see from the map that Renee made, thank you, Renee, that um, it shows the different areas where we have coalitions. And the EPA Advanced Program is something we actually have a contract with them and we send them information what we're doing to be proactive to help the community and taking steps to keep in attainment. And I think Renee did mention that they're um, looking at changing the NACs for ozone. So, you know, it could be ramping up here soon to do some outreach pro projects. The Diesel Emissions Reduction Act is also something that we have available at DHEC, and they are um, competitive. So there's the State Clean Diesel Grant Program, the National Clean Diesel Funding Assistance Program, the National Clean Diesel Tribal Grants, and the Clean Diesel Rebate. So there's four components to that. A lot of people will... Um, take a, an old model of a, let's say, a pickup truck or a dump truck and change it out with one that has a cleaner engine. Um, so I don't do that program. It's just in the Bureau of Air Quality, and I've got at the end, there's information who you can contact if you're interested in that. The radon program that I mentioned as well, um, again, I'm not the coordinator for that. We do have a coordinator for that, but Basically, with radon, if you don't test your home, you, you, there's no way to know if you have radon in your home. Um, and, and there's different ways to take care of that. So DHEC does not come in your home and take care of a radon issue, but we can offer information for contractors that can do that, what kind of system that you may need in your house to get the radon out if you test high for radon. I would love to do some more lawn maintenance events. Um, if anybody's interested in helping set those up or getting a group to do these. But anyway, this is an opportunity for people to get rebates towards electric powered lawn equipment um, to reduce air pollution. We were talking about, you know, how bad small engines are for the air. And here it says right here, today small engines emit high levels of carbon monoxide as well as hydrocarbons and nitrogen oxide, which do form ground level ozone that's harmful to, to the health and the environment. So that also answers your question you were asking earlier. And that is it for me. And from what I understand, we're taking questions at the very end, but here's my contact information. 
Renee's contact information, and Ryan Lutz is the one that is a coordinator for the radon program and the DARE grant program. We do have a new radon person. She's brand new. So I decided to put Ryan's name in here. And if he wants to, if anybody has any questions about it, he may defer you to Olivia is her name. And that is it for me. Thank you Thank so much, Amy. If you don't mind, yep, perfect. Just bring the screen share and we're going to pop up another set of slides real quick. Okay. Perfect. And I apologize. Just give me one more second to try and get to the right slide here. But I did just want to again say thank you to Amy and thank you to Renee. That's a lot of really good and important information that people need for their communities. Um, we talked about why why is talking about air quality so important. Um, actually, have a couple of numbers here. These are annual numbers, but it. What we have is, but the by revising those PM 2.5 standards that Renee showed can actually avoid a num we can actually avoid 13,000 to 24,000 incidences of premature death in people with heart or lung disease. We can avoid six, 17,000 cases of chronic bronchitis. Um, what do we have here? 17,000 non-fatal heart attacks, 15,000 hospital emissions for cardiovascular respiratory systems. Which are which are huge numbers. Um, we also talked about the fact that a lot of children have asthma. I actually, my child has asthma, and she's had a number of instances of missed school, nighttime hospital visits, and we do we check that air quality now before we go outside. So that's a great that's a great website. We really appreciate you sharing that. Now what we want to go in into is what can I'm going to skip that one because I want to get to this. Um, this is a really good way to remember what trees do with regards to air quality. So if you see the acronym, it's tree. So trees reduce temperature and they cause other microclimate effects. They remove air pollution. They reduce, they mitigate emission of chemicals and they help energy conservation and buildings by again, just reducing the temperature. Um, don't forget that urban trees reduce our, the heat island effect and they cool our cities as much as 9 degrees Fahrenheit and one tree cools as much as five air conditioners running 20 hours a day. So in that sense, we're both ensuring that people are not too hot and we're also reducing more air pollution just by not having air conditioners run so much. I also want to mention that there are some groups within our communities that are more sensitive to heat stress and more sensitive to air pollutants. So tree cover is a critical way to reduce heat exposure while also not increasing cooling costs for individuals and families. There's lots of benefits that trees have with regards to both pollution and um, pollution cost, everything that we always talk about in these webinars. Now, what I want to look at, and I'm going to thank Kara for finding these graphics because they're excellent. I want everyone to look at, on the left-hand side, you'll see the three circles and what looks like double-decker buses. I want to look at what the different designs are and how we can really utilize trees to mitigate air pollution in a proper way. So in that double-decker bus scenario, what you see is you have poor air quality because you have pollutants namely the exhaust and what's included in that exhaust that's just circling around in that enclosed space and you have people standing near the bus and being exposed to those pollutants. So we can understand from that that we have poor air quality, air, poor air quality in that design scenario. Now what we're going to move to is the, the, I guess it's green wall to the right hand side. And what the green wall, which I guess we could call that green infrastructure in that scenario, is doing is it is it's creating a lot of surface area. 
So those pollutants are being emitted from whatever source we're talking about, and they are sitting on those leaves as opposed to going into our lungs. So that is a strategy where, that we can use. The next scenario we have is we see it says, probably pretty small for everyone, but it says cafe. And you'll see it has a tree to the left and a tree to the right. So we don't have any notable sources of air of pollutant emissions and we have trees around so we probably have good air quality there and was also what you see is that there's because the buildings are different heights you get some mixing of air which is good so you're not trapping all of the pollutants at that street level now we're going now we're going to go into the next portion of that slide which is you're going to see the two cars that are behind each other and obviously on the street and you see that there are people that are going to be, you know, nearby and it actually says school on that slide. So it's like there's cars driving by and there's a school right there. So what we have there is that the air pollution is higher there because you have cars that are idling, right? They're stopping, starting, which is when you have more emission of air pollutants. And what you also have is you have some people that are in that school. So they, let's say if the window's open, they're being exposed to a lot of air pollutants. Now let's go a little bit further. So we have some kind of a shrub behind that last car there. And what that is showing you is that if you make some kind of a green barrier, you know, whether it's shrubs on one side and tree on the other, like the image is showing, you can, put, you can really protect people by increasing the air quality and shielding them from some of that air pollution. So you really do have to look at design on a micro level. You have to look at the site level to understand how to use trees and greenery to protect from air pollutants. I'm going to go to the next slide to show one more example. And I know that everyone has seen this probably. Let's look at the top of that image on the right. Um, you'll see that there are two buildings. There are cars on the outside of the buildings. There are trees in between the buildings. Let's say it's some kind of like a, like a green space in between the buildings. And there are people there. So in that case, you have people that are experiencing good air quality because they are not exposed to any pollutants within that space and they have the green infrastructure that's helping clean that air. So that, that's a good design. And then the example underneath it, which I don't know how many of you would say, I wish I could have you raise your hands, would say that's a good design because you have trees and you have people, it looks good. But what we know is that it's actually, you're not protecting the people from the pollutants as much as you might think because what you've done is you have cars that are going near the trees and what are the trees are doing in that situation is trapping the air pollutants at the ground level. So in that case, people are actually experiencing worse air pollution. I don't want to say because of the trees, because they would, you know, the trees aren't the pollutants, but it's not, it's not a good design scenario where you want is you want those cars to be on the outside of the buildings and you want the people to be where the cars are not. So I hope that makes sense to everyone. Um, we just want to talk about that. And if you look to the, the picture to the left, you'll see that those are the beautiful live oaks, which are excellent. Um, but Francis and Kara and I were talking about this, that it's so beautiful, but the trees are actually creating a, a barrier to where the pollutants are kind of stuck in that, in that you know, roadway. So oh, that's not a great place to walk and probably does not have very good air quality, especially if it's a very, if there's a road with a lot of cars on it. So just something to think about. I would encourage you to take a look at these drawings some more and to see how you can incorporate this on a site based, you know, on a site by site basis. And just to think about, are you trapping the air pollutants? Or are you letting them escape? So that is, that is it. For us, what I want to do right now is to open the floor for any questions, comments, anything anyone might have to say. Um, if you don't mind, please, please type it into the chat box. I see, I, I apologize. So I see a couple of comments already in here. So it looks like Donna has said, is there a link to a site? 
for the gas lawnmower or electric mower exchange rebate. What I'm going to do, Donna, and for everyone else, I'm going to I am going to email out these slides to all the registrants, everyone who registered for the webinar. So even if you couldn't make it today, I'll email it to you. And it, I think that Amy and Renee did an excellent job of including all of the links to all of their information on the bottom of their slides. Yeah, and um, this is Amy. I um, put in there that no, we do not have a link on DHEC's website because most of the, whoever hosts the event We'll put it on their website so we don't actually have anything. And Amy, if you don't mind speaking to Amanda's question, she said, I'd like to see reg or comment. I'd like to see regulation of gas powered lawn maintenance equipment on a municipal level, possibly for residential zoning as a start. Is anywhere in South Carolina doing that? That is a great question. And I cannot answer that question. I do not know um, if, if people are doing it like. The city of Columbia has a great sustainable program. Um, they, there's possibility that they're doing some of that. The Greenville area has 10 at the top, which is a um, community driven kind of uh, program that they have where they do a lot of this type of stuff. So I, I don't know. I don't know if there's a place that is doing that, but my guess would be it's going to be with some kind of coalition or um, council of governments, or even a city, county, municipality that might do it. So it's, it's probably place by place that is um, doing anything. I don't know, Renee, do you know of anybody? I don't know of anybody doing it. I know we wouldn't be doing it at the state level. It would have to be a on the county level or the city level uh, that would pass laws about that. that would yeah, that's what I was getting at. It wouldn't be DHEC doing it. No. Lee just chimed in, it would not be a function of zoning. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's great. Oh, um, good point. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It would probably be within um, whatever their um, guidelines for people that use that kind of equipment. But I, I know the state doesn't do that kind of thing. It's that that's definitely a, a city slash county. Sure. Absolutely. Um, I actually, I wanted to ask you, Amy and Renee, if you have contact information for some of those coalitions, because those might be good resources for people or like a list of where those coalitions, where you could find their contact information. Oh, yes, we have it for all of them. Super. Would that be in the slides that you already have or would that be a different, different um, list? You know, so the EPA advanced coalitions, um, there was a slide about that, but I don't, know that there was a website on there uh, in particular for those coalitions. I think we all work with different coalitions, like Renee, Renee probably works with a different group of coalitions than I do. It depends yeah. on what our job function is. Um, there are several coalitions. In, in fact, I have a meeting next week with my supervisor about starting to pull some of the coalitions back together. They kind of disbanded since we're in attainment. Sure. That always seems like when you have an emergency, everybody wants to get back together and fix it. Mm -hmm. So um, we haven't been in that situation in a while. But if the standards change and there's area of the state to go into non-attainment, I'll guarantee you these coalitions will be coming back together to do some events and some projects and programs to reduce air pollution. Well, and as we saw, as if they changed that PM 2.5 to nine to 10, there's probably some communities that are pretty close to not being into attainment. Right, and, and that's why we're trying to pull back the coalitions that are in areas that we might know that it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, Aiken being one of them, actually. Sure. So um, we're trying to pull the coalitions back. But, you know, I, Renee, I don't know that there's specifically a place to go and look. Well, what we use coalitions to you. We used to have a graphic, but I don't know how up to date it is because, like you said, people have kind of forgot about it since we've been in attainment. Um, we did have a graphic that had phone numbers on it, but I don't know that it's up to date. Yeah, I don't either. I know that the the coalitions I talked about is um, the the EPA advanced coalitions. Like if you go to DHEX website and do a search in the search engine, um, EPA advance program. 
I think the coalitions will come up under that. Super. Let me see if I can find it. Write that down. I'll email that out to people. So EPA advanced under okay. coalitions. Hold on. I might be able to just put it in the. Okay. While you're taking a look for that, I'm just going to go to the next comment question. Uh, this is from Tracy saying, is there ever going to be a time when developers and builders will absolutely not be allowed to tear down trees <laughs> and simply mitigate for it? Trees are vital as you just showed us here. I think that I, I wish we I wish we all knew the answer to that question, but I don't think we do. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, and then Marla Jean says, is there any chance of getting the city of Georgetown on a monitoring program with international paper and Liberty Steel increasing production? I think all the street side outdoor restaurant. I think with all the street side outdoor restaurants, that could be bad. Yeah, I mean. I'm going to go ahead and speak just from my experience. I know that there are communities that are have started their own air quality monitoring programs as a as a byproduct or as a result of some kind of factory production and they they're just concerned about what they're exposed to. So that would be like a local monitoring program and I know that there are nonprofits and that, that do that and there are funding sources to do that, whether that's through the EPA or your local environmental agencies. Yeah, that so, is true. We, we have monitored in Georgetown before. Um, we don't currently have a monitor there because the um, source that we were was the main source of pollution at the time had uh, one had closed down and the other had ramped down there production. Um, Georgetown is not an MSA, so we are not required to monitor there. But we, like I said, we have had monitors there because we've had concerns about uh, both of those particular companies. Um, but yeah, I think that would be great if they could get a local monitoring um, because there's definitely money out there for it. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a lot of money out there for it. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to, I want to go ahead and just wrap it up by again saying thank you to everyone on the, on the webinar. Thank you for, to our presenters. Thank you to the funders. We really appreciate your time and we appreciate your questions and all the thought provoking things that everyone brought up. Again, if you need your credits, please, please, please email me. I've seen a number of emails come in. Amanda, Joel, Marla Jean, Remy, Mary Ellen, Liz, Eddie, and Andrew, I've got you. So thank you. If you, if I didn't just say your name, please go ahead and send me an email if you still need credits. Okay. Um, as always, you can always reach out to any of us and I will send out the slides shortly. Thank you again. You all have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Thank you for um, having us. Thank you, everybody.